All right, good morning. If you open your Bible to Galatians chapter number four, we're going to talk about the reason for the season today. And I know Christmas has passed, but I didn't get a chance to say this the week before, so I'll say it the week after, and we'll see how this turns out. I call, kind of call this my annual Christmas rant, and uh, so, so uh, <clears throat> put on your asbestos britches this morning. We'll see if we can bah humbug the whole season <clears throat> by illuminating the reason. I'm going to read uh, Galatians 4, verse 1. Now I say that the... Oh, by the way, uh, I'm going to read all the scripture today. I made a list of this so that I don't have to rip my Bible up to do it. I have a lot of scripture, so because I'm recording, I'd like to be able to read it myself so that it gets on the, uh, on the recording. First one, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons." And I love that. That's, in my view, that's the best Christmas text that there is. Now, we know that when we get into talking about the birth of Christ, that it's only mentioned some in the scripture, even though it's pretty important that God came into the world. You know, it hadn't be happened before. It's kind of a cool experience. But it's overshadowed, of course, by the crucifixion. The, res uh, the, uh, the uh, birth of Jesus never saved anyone, but the crucifixion and resurrection has the potential to save everyone. So the uh, putting it all in perspective, <clears throat> in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, it talks about that event, and uh, it says, when the fullness of time was come, now I'm going to go down this outline and uh, see if you can keep up with it, and um, I'm going to take this piece by piece, and first talk about the fullness of time. So what made the time right? It says when the fullness of time was come. So the time was right for uh, at least the reasons that I have listed on the sheet here. At least six different things made the time right. The first thing we know is that Rome ruled the world. They were the, Rome, the world power. Now, if we go all the way back to Daniel chapter 2 and uh, beginning in verse number 40, remember the story? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and in that dream it troubled him so much that he said, uh, uh, you know, I'm troubled by this. I want to get my magicians to come in. And I like the word magicians because it has, starts with the word magi, which I think is... Uh, the people who were under the influence of Daniel finally came from the east at the birth of Christ. The Magi showed up, and I think they were a product probably of Daniel's prophecies. So it says that uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, and he couldn't remember the dream. So he called all his magicians in and said, give us the dream. Uh, uh, we'll interpret it. And he said, I can't remember the dream. He said, you're not really magicians if you can't tell me what the dream was, too. So they went, well, yeah, and he said, well, we're going to put them all to death. You're all a bunch of frauds, which was true, uh, except for Daniel. And Daniel said, wait, 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 let, let's talk about this. He said, I think I might be able to come up with the translation here of your dream, the interpretation. So he went back to his cronies. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's their Babylonian names. And he... Um, he said, fellas, we, we got to go to prayer here. Uh, we have to figure out what he dreamed, dreamt. How's that work? Dreamt? And thank you. And then um, we have to tell what the translation was. So they began to pray, and all of a sudden God gave them this revelation about this dream. Now, by the way, I want to say to you that before I went to North Africa, I would have laughed at dreams, saying, ah, that's a lot of baloney. But since I've been 10 years in North Africa, they all have dreams. They all have dreams about Jesus. 
they all see Jesus in a dream, and uh, those that do chase him until they figure out who it is. And even to this day, they're still doing that. So I came back from Africa a believer in the believers. And I thought it was pretty interesting that it, my view was changed. You know, there's nothing like a little trip abroad to change your view on things. We in America think that this is an American book. And uh, I got news for you. It, it wasn't given to America. Uh, we're just part of the recipients and, and, and glad to be on the list. Bl glad we got invited to the party. So he gave this interpretation of what he saw. And you remember the story. It was a big giant statue and the statue represented different things and certain eras of world history. And one of the things beginning in verse 40 in uh, Daniel chapter 2, and we're not going there, is the, um, the, uh, 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 the notion of the Roman Empire. And Rome was in God's view way before Rome was ever in Rome's view. And God knew all about Rome way before. The other empires were the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks. And so it's really a timeline leading up to the, the fullness of time. Because when Rome became in power, uh, it did some things. And uh, the first thing is, uh, there was what, what is called Roman peace. And uh, there's uh, another name for that. Do you know the other name for Roman peace? Anybody know that? It's called Pax Romana. And you look it up on Wikipedia and it'll say it was a 200-year span of time when Rome ruled and the world was at a virtual peace little insurrections here and there, but no world wars going on, no people trying to occupy other people's lands. So there's a, a reasonable amount of peace. And if you're going to bring a message into the world like Jesus, uh, it's nice to have the world not distracted by all these uh, wars going on so that uh, we can get this message out and it'll get across. So it's called Pax Romana, Romana, R-O-M-A-N-A. -A, and uh, the next one was called Roman Roads. So we know that Rome built roads all over the known world. Uh, they built roads here and there. And the Appian Way, you remember in your history books, that was a famous one that led into Rome. And, and so all these Roman roads made transportation reasonable. And uh, I'm calling it here the ancient internet because you could get from place to place. Remember Paul when he was on his missionary journey? He went every place and uh, he did it via these Roman roads instead of just walking across the fields and the mountains and the rivers and all. There were roads that would take him where he needed to go. The next thing we know is that the Bible was written in the common language for the first time in world history. So here we have a Hebrew book that would have stayed Hebrew uh, had it not been translated for anyone to read. And we also know this common language as, what'd you say? Latin. He said Greek, he said Latin. How many, how many for go for Greek? We'll, we'll, we'll vote this in here one way or another. It was called, the, we got several votes on Greek. So it was Koine Greek, which meant common Greek. So the word is Koine Greek, K-O-I-N-A, Koine Greek, A-E, I don't, I don't know. Somebody will spell it for us. And that uh, translation was also known as, anybody know what this called? The Septuagint. All right, and if you look that up, it says that it was a, uh, a translation by six Hebrew scholars from each tribe of Israel, and they were translating the scripture. That's the way tradition has it. And Septuagint means 70. So each one took and translated. This one translated. They compared to see how they were doing. This one translated, and they compared back. And this is a, a, no small project, but they translated it into Koine Greek. And as a result of that, the common language even on the day of Pentecost, was this Koine Greek language. Now, what do you think, just for fun, what do you think the Hebrews thought of this Greek translation?
Not much. Exactly. Say it again. Exactly. No doubt. What have you done? You've taken our scripture and you've translated it out of the, the, the language of heaven into these Greek. I mean, that's just, that's hideous. But nevertheless, uh, it made accessible the word of God to anybody that could read simple Greek. All right, so the next thing that we have, oh, and written in, there it is, the Greek language. And now we have also what's called a network of synagogues all over the known world. And if you go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 5, here's what it says. It says that there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So on the day of Pentecost, there were Jews out of every nation under heaven. And where, what, what were they doing in all, all these other nations? Well, they were there because of the captivities. In 721 B.C., the northern kingdom was taken captive. In 606 B.C., the southern kingdom was taken captive, uh, first into Assyria. Then the next known uh, world power was Babylon, and they were spread all over the known world. And in their diaspora or the dis dispersion uh, they ended up being a monotheistic mindset planted all over the known world how cool is that you know they were thinking to themselves why would god do this to us and god said i got a plan i got this all figured out in fact this is the perfect application of jeremiah 29 11. i know the plans i have for you and he spread them out so that uh, they could on the day of Pentecost, come back for this feast day, they'd get the, whole, the gospel from Peter, who stood up and preached probably in Koine Greek, and the tongues that they heard were the native tongues of their own language, uh, countries where they came from, nothing unknown about it. And uh, uh, that's one of the reasons I say that uh, Pentecostalism is not Pentecostal at all, because it's not what happened on the day of Pentecost. It's just a new made up thing that happened in guess what year, about 1901 in this country. A wave started and now it's just this big giant distraction and, and I don't know what it has to do with anything except look at me, I'm more spiritual than you because I can talk in a tongue that nobody understands except me and that's pretty convenient. That was sarcastic, wasn't it? <laughs> but but me very very me he said so here's what happened and at this acts chapter 2 and verse 5 they came to pentecost uh feast they it, it, those that did accepted the gospel they went back to their countries wow this is cool they're filled with the holy spirit now what a cool marketing plan marketed through the prophets, pulled off on the day of Pentecost, and propagating the world with the gospel, the fullness of time had come. The fullness of time had come. So the first phrase that we're looking at here was when the fullness of time was come. Here's what happened. God sent forth his son. Now, there's a lot of scripture about that. Let me read some of this, and uh, we'll uh, analyze a little bit here. In Galatia, or Genesis 3.15, this is God talking to Satan. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and you shall bruise his heel. So if you're Adam and Eve standing there listening to that conversation, you say, What? Uh, I don't know what that means. You know, that's kind of weird. And probably no one knew what it meant until Luke chapter 24 on the road to Emmaus when Jesus walked along with the guys out of Jerusalem and they said, don't, don't you know what happened in Jerusalem? All these things that happened? And he said, what things? Well, I, I love that question because he's really asking them on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection, what do you think happened? And they went, well, we're not sure. Uh, we, this, we thought this Jesus was the Messiah. Obviously he's not. They killed him. How could he be? You know, and then he went to the grave, and, and some people said he's rose from the dead, and we don't know what to think. 
You know, we can't figure this out. And he said, you're, you're, you fools and slow, of, you, you don't believe what the prophets have said? And it says, very cool, he, from there on the rest of this journey, he expounded unto them in all things concerning the prophecy, concerning his suffering, because they didn't understand the Messiah had to suffer. Well, the first suffering verse would have been Genesis 3.15, a wounding of the heel and bruising of the head and, the head and some, kind of, uh, 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 some kind of cosmic conflict that takes place at the spiritual level. And he went back and said, the seed of the woman shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And they went, is that what that means? <laughs> wow. That's a pretty cool thing. We never thought about that. We never could figure that out. So that's the first notion that a woman would have a son. And uh, verse number Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, Emmanuel which means what a word. God with us. I mean, who would come up with that? I never would. I don't know about you, but that's quite a cool experience. God turning up in flesh. Isaiah 9, 6, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, which hasn't happened yet. And his name shall be called Wonderful, which has happened. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And I think the one thing missing in the world these days is just very simply peace. Jerusalem means city of peace. Wow, what a joke. When is the last time it had peace? Never, but it's scheduled. I like that. It's on the schedule. Uh, Micah 5 and verse 2, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, even from everlasting. So Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 tells about this birth. God sent forth his son. And uh, it even tells the city where he would be born or the town. And you say, well, how in the world would God know uh, that far in advance where he would be born? Well, God knows. Uh, come on, give me a break. God knows everything. N did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? <laughs> he, he already knew it. <laughs> he never went, oh, yeah. One of my wife's uh, favorite things for me to say when I'm sitting in my chair is this, I have an idea. And she goes, oh boy, here we go. Fasten your seatbelts. Let's see what happens. Now, yeah. How in the world can we get this birth to take place exactly the same, the right spot at exactly the right time? We got to get this family, this virgin who's about to have a son, We've got to get him into a place in Bethlehem, and he probably wasn't from there anyway, the people. So here's what we did. We had this, uh, this king uh, went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. He said that the whole world should be taxed. Obviously, he was a Democrat. <laughs> Tax everybody. And you've got to go back to your city to be taxed. And when you get there, then we're going to exact a tax from you. And by the way, what do you think was his motive for doing that? You think it was to get the Messiah born in Bethlehem? I think it was money driven. Most politics is, I'm sorry to say. And it's just uh, sad, 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 the state of our country right now. I think we've kind of lost it, and I think it's irredeemable. Uh, we'll just have to pray for even so come Lord Jesus. That'll be the solution when the Prince of Peace shows up. In, uh, where am I? Uh, first, uh, what am I? Okay. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, if this isn't the Christmas story, it doesn't exist. Listen to this. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God 
was manifest in the flesh, that's Emmanuel, justified in the spirit, the spirit descended on him, remember that, at his baptism, seen of angels, they were the heavenly choir singing to the shepherds that night, preached unto the Gentiles, the first guy that got the message was Cornelius, we talked about that last night, and uh, believed on in the world, and that's the requirement for salvation. It couldn't get much simpler or maybe couldn't be much harder. Uh, I'm not sure how to view that. It had to be something that anyone could do so that it wouldn't eliminate anybody. Believe. Believed on in the world. I was explaining this to Matt last night. I picked him up. He's new in our house out there. And we were going through this, how does this work thing and I said, believe. No, wait a minute. Believe. No, I'm wait a minute. I'm more than a... I believe. It's got to be serious. It can't just be a once over lightly. Sure, sure, sure. I believe that. One of our guys in the house, Thomas, little Thomas. I laugh at this every time I think about it. I said, so where do you stand with God, you know? And, and uh, what's going on with you spiritually? He said, well, I believe in God and Jesus and all that. I said, wow, that sounds a little cheap to me. Just a little bit cheap, you know. So we had a little talk about that and explained how that has to be drilled down quite a bit to get the right kind of belief, right? Believed on in the world and then what? Received up into glory and that's uh, Acts 11 and verse, or Acts 1 verse 11. You men of Judea, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that you see go into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. You, you saw him go and guess what? That's the way he's coming back. And for my money, it could be any day and I'd be just as happy. If you notice, I'm turning this way when I turn because you warned me not to turn that way because, uh, all right, there we go. Now, let's, uh, let's, uh, so God's son, why do you think, why do you think it, we have the word God sent forth his son? Was he the, was he really the son? I mean, how does that work? And that's one of the sticking points of the people in Islam. You mean God's having babies? That's blasphemy. Cut off his head. Why do you think he's called son? I mean, Emmanuel is not son. That's God in the flesh. That's God that showed up. What are you thinking, Meg? You got a look on your face. I never thought of that before. Well, thank you. I'm going through. My job here is complete. I've got Meg thinking. <laughs> I don't think there is a word for it except Emmanuel. So you have to come up with a word that makes some kind of a bond, but also recognize the fact that he entered the world as a baby. That's the only place you could come up with son. Otherwise, it kind of confuses the matter because God, this is not a, a son. This is God that showed up in the flesh. A son. So that got him into the ranks of son. And he calls God father. There it is. But in fact, there's a little pecking order here, isn't there? And, and you've got to kind of try to figure that out, which good luck getting your head around that. And I'm not, that's, that, that's Andy's lesson next week. <laughs> when the fullness of time was come, here's what happened. God sent forth his son. Then it says, made of a woman. Well, that kind of, Eliminates the man from the transaction, doesn't it? So this virgin birth, in fact, Genesis 3.15, the seed of woman, no mention of a man in this, in this thing. So it's got to be a miraculous experience. And of course, 
you know what we've done with that, do you not, in our religious world? We've exalted her above God. We've turned her into more than she ever was. That's the way religion is. Religion always evolves beyond truth. It always evolves beyond truth. You take a little speck of truth, and this is my famous phrase, you wrap 10 pounds of baloney around it, and, you call, and now it's called religion. And you put all your denominational rules to it and all your religious ideas, and you, and you get it so that nobody can understand it, and, and, and it's just crazy. It's crazy. Nobody can live by it. And Jesus chided the scribes and the Pharisees for doing that. He said, you can pass land and sea to make one proselyte which is a convert to their religion. And when you do, you make him twofold more a child of hell than yourselves. That's Matthew 23. You mean the religious people were going to hell? That's what Jesus just said. You're going to hell and so are they because you cling to your religion. I'm going back to Genesis chapter 10. And in Genesis chapter 10, is, a, is a, uh, an experience. There's a lot of genealogy there, and it talks about this guy named Nimrod, who um, was famous in this place called Babel, and he was a mighty hunter, the Bible says, and uh, as a result of it, people sort of were drawn to him. He's kind of a charismatic fellow, and he... Uh, got the people involved in building this Tower of Babel. Because, you know, finally they said, and if, you, if, you're, if you're on the throne long enough, somebody's going to say, he's a god. And uh, before long, they're going to start worshiping. And they did. And so Nimrod said, I'm going to build this Tower of Babel, and we're going to go up into heaven. And you remember the story. God said, no, you're not doing that. And it's, it's funny, it's he said, let's go down there and see what they do. And when they went down, they went, oh, this is ridiculous. How are we going to keep these people from doing this? They're not going to reach heaven. What, were they, what, I mean, what was their point anyway? Why do you want to reach heaven? What were they after? I think Nimrod wanted to overthrow God. And I think it's something we try to do all day long in our country. We try to overthrow God. We're trying to get him out of our schools, get him out of our hearts, get him out of our minds. And in fact, that's what we do at, 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 uh, at Christmas time. We don't talk about Jesus as much as we do Santa. You know that's true. In our country, that's our country. Not us, maybe. Or maybe. Maybe. So here's what happened. Nimrod was considered a god. Well, Nimrod's mother said, you know what? If he's a god, then I must be the mother of God. <laughs> and when he died off, she took over, and she exalted herself as the mother of God, and that requires some, I mean, you know, that's respect, right? And you probably want to pay me something for that, and, because uh, it's a... Uh, and I'm looking now way over in Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse number 18. Let me read this verse. The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger, says God. So they're, what are they doing? Well, they're worshiping the queen of heaven. Where did that idea come from? Nimrod's mother, you know, she's the, well, I mean, she's got to be the queen of heaven. And by the way, in Jeremiah, it's mentioned five times the queen of heaven because these people were bad and they were going into idolatry and they were worshiping the queen of heaven. In chapter 44 of Jeremiah, you see it mentioned four other times, worshiping the queen of heaven. You see, when you got a I want to say a good thing. When you got a bad thing, don't let it go. Just keep it going, you know, see how far you can take this. How far did we take it? Well, you know how far we took it. Now, we have, if you drive down I-4, and he does this every week, when he gets into Orlando, there's a big monument on the right, and there used to be a statue of Mary with a crown on her head, and uh, it was called the Queen of the Universe. 
the queen. Are you kidding me? You got this poor little Jewish girl, and she's, she didn't sign up for this. You know, she was certainly blessed and highly favored, no doubt in my mind. But man, she even called Jesus my Lord and my Savior. Mm -hmm. Just trying to figure it out herself, you know. When I was in Portugal as a missionary, I did this little Bible study with a group of people. And um, <clears throat> my it was a family situation. And the... Uh, on here was sitting a, the uh, educational director at the Catholic Church. And over here, some, over here, my hostess's brother, who was a medical doctor, and his mother. And so we had a family, kind of a family affair there. And so <clears throat> one day the medical doctor said to me, what about Fatima? Well, over in Portugal, there's this place called Fatima, which, by the way, is an Arabic word. I don't know where that came from. But they, over there, this little teenage girl and boy, they met, were late for dinner one day. And all of a sudden, Mary showed up to them and uh, said to them, pray the rosary. And they went, oh, my gosh, what's going on? And so now they have a church over there that you can't believe it, the, the uh the uh, area will hold a million worshipers. They crawl on their hands and knees there. They light candles galore. They can do it. In fact, you can go and buy a b candle made into a certain body part, whatever body part you're praying for this week, you know. And so some of this is, gets a little obscene, you know. And uh, so they light all these candles with all these body parts. And uh, they're just, it turns into like a bonfire. And they're just trying to find favor with God because... This ground must be holy because Mary showed up there. <laughs> That's sad. Mary would never own it. So my guy said, what about Fatima? I said, well, let's talk about Fatima for a minute. You know, here's a scripture, and uh, it, it says this, that uh, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And he said, well, I think that she should have some sway with God. I mean, she's important. She ought to have, be able to persuade him of something. And so I gave that one mediator between God and men. And the Catholic director of education said, wow, that's pretty plain. And I said, well, that's what I think. She said, man, that kind of, a, that, that kind of eliminates the saints, doesn't it? I said, yeah, I didn't write it. I'm just reading it, you know. <laughs> And I said, as long as we're eliminating, how, what if we eliminated the Pope? Right. Oh, man, that made her heart beat fast, you know. And I said, well, look, here's this little Jewish girl. And all of a sudden, we're say, let's get the mechanics of prayer down. So this little Jewish girl, and she's a mere mortal. She goes to heaven in the place where all of these spirits are, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, and how many prayers a day go to Mary? I said, she can't handle all that, man. She's going to have overload, prayer overload. Did you see that movie, uh, Bruce Almighty? Remember that movie? He, he, he said, I can't. I don't know. How long? What am I going to do? Okay, he's going to answer everything. Yes, boom, and it blew the world up, you know. So. <laughs> well, here's Mary trying to navigate all that. I said, so you pray to Mary, and, and the, or you just... And how does it get to heaven? Well, I think the Spirit of God takes it because Mary can't hear your prayer. So it's got to get to heaven on the Spirit. So the Spirit gets up there and says to Mary, Mary, we have a tough case here. We're going to have to call you in. I said, does that sound reasonable to you? I mean, that just sounds ridiculous to me. By the way, what did Mary know uh, in the uh, 8th century about the rosary? Pray the rosary? This is a, I mean, that didn't even come about until like 600 A.D. A guy named Peter the Hermit wanted to get that into the Catholic Church. So he, they said, no problem, we'll include it. You know, we can do bead counting and stuff like that. And I said, does that make sense to you, to my medical doctor that asked the question? And you know what he said? I still think she has influence. Oh my gosh. 
I mean, what do I have to say here? So I was picking up my pearls, you know, and about to leave. And uh, finally, when, when, I, when I left Portugal, this medical doctor said, I'll be praying for you. I said, thank you very much. He said, and I'll do it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I said, thank you. <laughs> now, we, now, now we have a serious prayer going on. Yeah. So what are we doing here? In the, he sent forth his son, born of a woman. Well, I got news for you. Run over to Revel, Revelation chapter 17. And I think we're going to take a peek at that. And uh, very quickly, I don't want to take too much time because I don't know how much time I have, actually. Uh, but I'm going to go till I'm done, so it doesn't matter. Revelation 17. You got a Bible? Turn there. Let's take a look at this. Verse 1, are you there? Page 1346. Nobody's Bible has four, just That's mine. You got it? Yeah, right here, <laughs> there came one, uh, verse one, one of the seven angels that had the seven vials talked with me saying, come up here. I'm going to show you the judgment of the great whore. What an ugly word that sits upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Jump to verse 5. And upon her head was written a mystery name, Mystery Babylon the Great. Oh, we're still talking about Babylon? We're going all the way back to Nimrod? The mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. Wow. Verse 7, the angel said, I'm going to tell you the mystery. Verse number 9, it says, here's the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And if you jump down to verse 18, and the woman which you saw is the great, that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. That's interesting got to be Rome. Many think, see that gets me off the hook, many think, many scholars say, see you can get all kinds of disclaimers going on here. So I'm saying that one of these days this religious proposition is just going to be put down and I don't think it's necessarily the Catholic Church, I think it's the birth of religion that started in Genesis chapter 10. Religion just started growing and multiplying, and this great whore is called the mother of harlots, more, plural. So it just springs forth as man-made religion, and one of these days it's all going to be put down. It'll be put down. Born of a woman, how about this? Born under the law. Well, I lost my page. Born under the law. What does that mean, born under the law? Well, it means that he subjected himself to the law. What law, by the way? Well, we know that there was the religious law and the ceremonial law, all that. But we also know those physical laws. I mean, when you become flesh and you're the mighty God, a spirit, and you become flesh, you've got to lay aside some godness just to get here in the flesh in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 2, when he was doing his temptation, it says, and he was hungry. Can you imagine God being hungry? So he subjected himself to the physical laws. He subjected himself to the laws of gravity. He subjected himself to pain. He subjected himself to all the same grief that we have. In fact, the Bible says that he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Not only that, but also the spiritual laws. Romans 6 and verse 23, it says the wages of sin is death. You can go all the way back to the Old Testament. And you can find out that there's a death penalty on all of us. We're all under the curse. We live under the curse. So he subjected himself to that law. And we know this because... Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, where am I here? Let this mind be in you 
which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. So he laid aside his godness, became a man in the likeness of men and a servant being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, can't imagine God doing that, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Have you ever thought of this? God invented death for that reason, so that he himself could die. Because what, I mean, what, what's the, well, you know, we know that God is love. And we also know that, here, listen to this, Jesus said, greater love is no man than this, that a man lays down his life. So in order to demonstrate his love, he had to, so, so God is love, but had no one to die for. Hmm. Just to give you something to think about at three in the morning when you can't sleep. And finally, in Hebrews chapter 1, it says, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power that he might by himself purge our sins. And he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he has an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So he's born under the law and subjected himself to the law and even went to the cross and died on the cross. And the reason he did that was because You're a sinner. Ah. Make it personal. It is personal. There's a good effect to it, though, to redeem them that are under the law. So the point of the whole thing is to provide redemption for us. I went around our house on Thanksgiving at the vocational church and I said, I want you to just say one thing that you're thankful for. You only get to use one word and you can't use the word that anybody else used. So you have to keep coming. And, you know, one was gratitude and one was, uh, you know, salvation and one was redemption. I thought there's a great word, redemption. It means that... Uh, God went and claimed us. You ever go to a pawn store, pawn shop, and you claim something? And not getting into the theology of all that. And here's the bottom line to Romans chapter 8 and verse number 14. And it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You have not yet received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So we get to approach God. Remember when, when the apostles came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. John taught his disciples to pray. Would you teach us to pray? And he said, okay, I'll pray. here's the way it starts. Our Father who art in heaven. And they went, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Father? We've always called him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We've always exalted him uh, in all of these big, uh, powerful uh, 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 position names. And now we can call him Father? I think it revolutionized their prayer life. I think they said, oh, man, I'm going to do some of this. I'm going to, I'm going to do that. We've kind of gotten out of the spirit of that, I'm afraid, but they didn't. Sons, hallelujah, sons of God. William said that at Christmas time I included him with my family. Well, guess what? 
That's what God did. He included you with his family. Not bad. Go to Romans chapter 1. I want you to turn there if you would. And um, uh, I hope I'm doing the right thing here. I'm going to look in verse number 20 because I'm asking the question. And let's just go here and read this and then we'll talk about it. And then this is where the bah humbug comes in. Are you ready? Verse 20. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, listen to this, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You ever think about this? We've given Santa Claus all the characteristics of God. He's omnipresent. Same night, he's anywhere, everywhere, all at the same time. He creates gifts. He doesn't get them at Amazon. He just creates them. Now and then he'll get an elf or two to help him, you know. But He, he hears and answers prayer. Do you ever think of that? Well, write him a letter. Tell him what you want. He rewards righteousness. You better be good. If you don't. Yeah. By the way, no kid ever believed that. Because they never did get good. But they always get the presents. Years ago, my niece, when she was small, they said to her, look, if you ever see the presents, they're going to turn into sticks. So don't ever do that before Christmas. And they put a bag of sticks in the car. And she went out to, the, they said, go to get, get the something in the car. And they went out and she saw this. She opened it and she screamed. <laughs> she came inside and they said, what happened? She said, nothing. <laughs> said, Man, that's a dirty trick, isn't it? But do you see what's happened here? We have stopped worshiping Emmanuel entering the world. We have tinselized the whole thing. We have, I think, done disrespect to Jesus. I think. It keeps going. Listen to this. For God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. They changed the truth of God into a lie. Oops. Worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections for even their women change the natural use into that which is against nature likewise also men leaving the natural use of the women burning in their lust one toward another men with men receiving that which is unseemly receiving in themselves the recompense of the air which is meat so we have in our country now this homosexuality that is celebrated you know it used to be in the closet now it's on the front page and it's celebrated because somebody came out of the closet and they have movies now they have tv now they want the gayest of all the gay to be on the front page and put them in the spotlight some i'm just thinking here's my question down here can we trace the spiritual status of our country I just wonder. We certainly aren't spiritual anymore. We have little pockets, but even our pockets are. See, we used to think this, here's the, here's the church and here's the world. We've got to be different from the world, right? 
But here's what happened. As the world disintegrated and the morals, we stay different than the world. We stay different even though right now we might be less than they used to be. You know, we used to laugh at Ozzy and Harriet. Yeah. Have, can we trace our country to our treatment of God? That's what I'm asking. Can we do it? And we know in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him, given him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Christ to the glory of God the Father. So one of these days every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess that Jesus is Christ to the glory of God the Father. I made a little, uh, I made a little post the other day. I want you to read it and see what you think about it. I put this on Facebook just because I was having one of these mournful moments. <laughs> I'm going to read it to you and you can look at it. It says, Dear Jesus, I'll give you a second. There's some more. I said, I'm sorry that this is my apology. You there? I'm sorry that we have allowed Satan to be exalted over you. I'm sorry, Santa. Freud, Freud is alive and well. I'm sorry that your holy name has become a swear word. You ever wonder why nobody ever says, oh, Buddha? Well, what's the point? There's nothing to slander there. I'm sorry that religion has attributed your existence to Mary. I'm sorry that your miraculous resurrection is substituted with a chocolate bunny. I'm sorry that we have worshipped the creature over the creator. I'm sorry that you are called the man upstairs when you are so much more. I'm sorry we don't share you with our friends. I'm sorry our lives are run without your input. Then I got a little personal. I'm sorry that I pray only after I can't fix it. I'm sorry that my sinfulness added to your suffering. I'm sorry we live as if you don't exist. And I left a blank. Anything come to mind that could be added there? Maybe you come up with something on your own. I'd say I'm sorry because we don't always pray in the rain. It may be generic. Yeah. Any other thought? <clears throat> and this is the way I ended. Please forgive us. We, we know not what we do. You see, here's what's happened. Our, our country's going to hell. I don't know if you noticed that or not. In fact, the whole world is. I got a text from North Africa on Christmas Day kind of fun. One of our guys over there quoted a Bible verse on Christmas Day to me. And I thought, oh, very nice. See, here's the, here's the thing. <laughs> over there, they haven't gotten over Jesus yet. I'm afraid we kind of have. And
with that, I'm done. Let me pray out. Dear God, bless us now as we ponder these things today. Help us to be better people. In Jesus' name, amen.